When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that knows that love ain't the same on the south side of town. He is the captain. But it's about $1.50 less. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today, we got something awesome in the fridge. We are sipping on Ginger Ninja by Black Hog Brewing Company. This is a red IPA brewed with fresh ginger, lemon, and hibiscus with an ABV of 6.5%. Garage grade four out of five bottle caps. And this awesome IPA is brought to us by these garage ninjas right here. First up, cheers to Remington down in South Carolina. Remington is spreading the good word by telling everyone to be good, be kind, and don't litter. And big shout out to James in Margate City, New Jersey. And here's a double cheers, Captain, going out to Tyler and Tristan in Panama City, Florida. And back down under to Thomas in Melbourne, Australia. Next, we have Michael and Becky in Austin, Texas. And last but certainly not least, we have Mandy sending us a cheers from Indiana. So thanks, everybody, for helping us out with this week's show. If you want to help us out with next week's show, put a little beer in that fridge. Go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. B W E W R U N beer run, and that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. You know, a question that a man always has to ask himself when he goes through something like I went through. Are you in a better spot than you were before? Was it worth it? And the answer to me is yes. And the sooner man gets to leading a life of transparency, the better off he is. And you do that by making things simple. But what we do, because of sin, things get complicated. I mean, every day the devil would beat me up. Every single day the devil would beat me up and remind me of what a bad person I was. And what that does, that, that keeps harboring you know, the crime and keeps burying you. And what you then, you can't be of any use to anybody. January 1982, Santa Clara, California. A baby is born. 
This is Patrick James Dennehy. Patrick grew up to be tall and athletic. He played basketball on the Wilcox High School team located in Santa Clara. As a sophomore, Dennehy averaged 20 points, 14 rebounds, and 8 blocks a game. Afterward, he transferred to St. Francis High School in Mountain View. He was rated a 1999-2000 High Honorable Mention All-American by Street and Smith's Magazine. This despite missing half of his senior season due to a torn ACL, an injury that required surgery. The high school star athlete then went on to play college basketball, a scholarship player at the University of New Mexico, where he was listed as a six foot nine inch tall backup forward. As a freshman, he played in 33 games and started two, and was named the school's most improved player. As a sophomore in 2001 2002, Dennehy, now listed as a center, started 28 games and played in 30 in total, averaging 10.6 points, 7.5 rebounds per game, and was named All-Mountain West Conference Honorable Mention. But remember, friends, the fall is always a lot faster than the climb. Patrick Dennehy got into hot water with his coach and teammates. This is after he stormed out of a practice, leading Patrick Dennehy to be kicked off of the basketball team. But Dennehy made enough of an impact on his team and in his conference, finishing fifth in the conference in rebounds, that he's going to get another opportunity. He was offered a roster spot on the University of Baylor's basketball team, where per league rules, he would be required to sit out a year for making the transfer. Baylor, a proud Baptist university, This is where Dennehy made a religious and personal transformation. Then after sitting out for a year, Patrick Dennehy, now 21 years old, 6 foot 10 inches tall and weighing 230 pounds, was ready to play for the Baylor Bears in the upcoming 2003-2004 season. And it was looking like Baylor was ready to try to make a run at not only defeating the big dogs like Texas and Kansas, but making a run at winning the Big 12 championship. This team seemed to be full of transfers from other colleges. One of those transfers was Carlton Dotson. Dotson played for Paris Junior College in East Texas and transferred at the same time as Dennehy, but per league rules, Dotson was allowed to play immediately. Carl Dotson, in his first year playing for the Baylor Bears, played in 28 games and averaged almost 16 minutes a game. But in 2003, a new junior college transfer was making his way to Baylor. This is Harvey Thomas. Head coach Dave Bliss believed Harvey Thomas was the missing piece and informed Carl Dotson that his playing time was going to go down significantly. Dotson was going to leave the team, and university and transfer again if he could find a school. In early 2003, Carl Dotson and his wife split up. Dotson goes to live with his good friend and teammate Patrick Dennehy in an apartment. At some point, Dotson answers an ad. This is for a breeder who is selling pit bull puppies. Dotson and Dennehy go to a farm to check out the pups. There, the two become friends with the property owners. This is Darren and Tammy Cox. But hold on to your horses because it's going to become a bumpy ride pretty quick. Dotson and Dennehy, they go to their coaches with a complaint. And this is not your normal type of complaint. They're not talking about basketball or things related to their time playing, their court time, any of that. This is more serious. This is they are saying that $300 was stolen from their apartment, and that they were being threatened by some of their other teammates. It does not appear that any action was taken regarding these complaints, but we know that these complaints took place. So these young men are going to take action into their own hands. On June 2, 2003, they tell friends that they have purchased guns to protect themselves. After the five-day waiting period, On June 7th, Dennehy and Dotson show one of their doggy friends, Darren Cox, two guns 
they say were purchased because they were concerned about their personal safety. They asked if they could practice shooting these guns at the farm and permission was granted. Yeah. On June 11th, Dennehy's other roommate, Chris Turk, leaves for a trip. Patrick Dennehy makes a long-distance call to his girlfriend in Albuquerque. This is longtime girlfriend Jessica De La Rosa. On June 12th, Patrick Dennehy attends his final class of the year. Two days later, Dennehy tells his friend Daniel that he is worried about threats to Carlton Dotson by two of their teammates. He also tells Daniel that both he and Dotson will meet him at a party the next day, but neither Dennehy or Dotson ever show up to this party. So you have these roommates that go to their coach saying, hey, we've got $300 that are missing, and now we're getting these threats. Now I'm assuming that now that they're you know, worried about these threats that are coming from quote-unquote teammates, were these the threats that they talked about to their coach earlier? It appears that all of this is the same, stemming from all the same story. Right. The next day on June 15th, Dennehy's mother and stepfather, they find it very odd that they didn't hear from Patrick Dennehy on that day. This is Father's Day. Yeah. And he does not call home to, to speak with his father. On June 16th, the other roommate, uh, Chris Turk, and I say other roommate because remember we have Dennehy and Dotson and Chris Turk living there. Yeah. This Chris Turk, he returns from his out-of-state trip and finds that Dennehy's dogs have not been fed in what he says he believes to be days. Now, a few days go by, and Patrick's parents still have not heard from their son. And in fact, they are in the process of trying to track him down. They want to know why they've not heard from him, where could he be, what's going on with this young man. Well, after talking with Patrick's friends and his girlfriend, they decide to step up the search and they actually report Patrick Dennehy missing on June 19th, 2003. Now is anybody reporting uh, Carlton missing? No, no one is reporting Carlton missing. And this is also why I included some of the events leading up to when he's actually reported as missing. So we have the other team, the other roommate, Chris Turk, saying, hey, I left for this trip, and when I left, everything was normal, everything was fine. Right. And we know that Dennehy spoke to his long-distance, long-time girlfriend, and... Everything was fine then. Everything was fine. They were actually planning on when they would see each other. Remember, he had attended his last class of the year. But he might have met, mentioned the threats to her. Or do we do we know that? I don't know that he did. Okay. Uh, there's nothing to state that he did. But what we do know is when Chris Turk returns from his out-of-state trip, he's like, look, that's when things appeared weird to me. Everything was fine when I left. I get back, and his dogs appear to be starving. Yeah. They've not been fed in days. And, oh, by the way, nobody has heard from Patrick Dennehy, including his parents, who he was very close to, not calling on Father's Day, and his girlfriend that he was very close to, has not heard from him since that last phone call. Right. The dogs, maybe. I mean, you know, little Frank, he he acts like he's starving all the time, even right after he just ate. So, but big red flag to go, hey, here's this guy that, you know, is getting on track to, to play some basketball. Seems like a good guy. Why didn't he call home Father's Day? Mm-hmm. Well, now we have the Waco Police Department. They're involved because now we have a missing persons report that has been filed. So on June 23rd, the Waco Police Department, they file an affidavit seeking a search warrant. This is for Dennehy's computer. They want to get into that computer, see what was going on, see if they can find a trail of breadcrumbs to lead them to Patrick Dennehy. Yeah. Now, this next part certainly scared the hell out of Patrick's friends and family because on June 25th, so this is six days after he is officially reported missing to police. On June 25th, Patrick Dennehy's Chevy Tahoe is found in a mall parking lot. Now, this 
is way out in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Mm -hmm. So not only would the 1,400 miles distance and the 21 hours of driving time scare the hell out of me, yeah. but the the vehicle is also found without license plates. Yeah, this is not good. So somebody moved this vehicle this great distance, 1,400 miles, and tried to conceal it by removing the license plates. Police don't know how it ended up there or who moved it there or if, in fact, it could have even been Patrick himself. Yeah. But then just two days later, a statement is issued by police saying the potential suspects in this missing persons case include Patrick's teammates. In relation to this statement, amongst other aspects of this investigation, a St. Petersburg, Florida attorney who is known to have represent athletes says he has been hired by one of Patrick's teammates. This is Patrick's quote unquote friend and roommate, Carlton Dotson. The attorney says Carlton Dotson is at his home in Maryland and will not discuss the case. Well, that's interesting, right? What's yeah. pretty close to Virginia Beach, Maryland. Maryland. And this poor young man has gone missing in Texas. During all of this, the authorities back in Waco, Texas, have been conducting ground and aerial searches looking for the young man. Now, most of these are conducted in large areas, some of which are large open areas. And they seem to be focusing in on three areas in particular, one of them being the Cox Farm, where... Right. So this is where they became friends with the people that were selling the puppy, the puppies. Right. And they also got permission once they became friends with these people to, to shoot guns and target shoot and practice shooting these guns on their property. Well, we got a bunch of weird stuff going on. We have these two athletic men. Well, we got three that are living together. But everything seems fine other than there was some money missing and that we have possibly some threats happening. Mm -hmm. So then these guys feel threatened enough that they're going to get guns to protect themselves. And now we have one of the one of the basketball players car is 1400 miles away right and we have his roommate his quote-unquote friend saying hey i'm not talking about this and so july 9th we have dennehy's mother coming out and saying the coaches told her that her son said he was being stalked so i wonder if that's something he said when he said hey we're, we, somebody took this money we're being threatened and i'm being stalked i wonder if that's when he told the coaches about that. Well, and according to ESPN, Patrick's mother said that, that she and her husband, they regret that their son never alerted them about his fears, yeah. stating that if he had, Dennehy's stepfather said, quote, I would have been on the first plane to Waco. Hmm. On July 17th, Carlton Dotson has a meeting at the Dorchester County Sheriff's Office in Delaware, after which no charges are filed and Carlton walks out of this meeting a free man. The next day, a maintenance worker at an apartment complex found and turned over to police a handgun. This is the apartment complex where Harvey Thomas, remember the new kid in town, Mm -hmm. the believed to be missing piece on the Baylor basketball team. This is where he lived. Mm. But then in a strange and surprising twist to some, but not to all on July 21st, Carlton Dotson is arrested in Maryland and charged with the murder of Patrick Dennehy. Oh. This is, this goes down in a very weird manner. Okay. So as soon as police come out and yeah, say... Yeah, yeah, because hold on, because we, we have these two friends that live together. They both go to the coaches. They, they're they fearful enough. They say there's threats. They're fearful enough that they get guns. And and now he's being arrested w with the involvement of his friend's disappearance. Mm -hmm. Okay. And remember, he's in Maryland. And when yeah. we... When the, attorney for Dotson first comes out to the media and says, look, I'm representing Carlton Dotson. Now 
He's staying in his Maryland home. He's not going back to Waco, Texas. And he's not going to be discussing this case with media at this time. Oh. We do know that he has this meeting with the sheriff's department. Now, he's still in his hometown. He's not back in Waco, Texas yet. The weird thing that comes out here is when they interview him and they, they allow him to leave, they very quickly, the sheriff's department very quickly tells the media that he didn't say anything incriminating during the course of this meeting. He didn't say anything that led us to believe that or would give us more suspicion than we currently have. Right. Even though he's all these many miles away and the vehicle, Patrick Dennehy's Chevy Tahoe is found a lot closer to Carlton Dotson than where Pat went missing. From. Yeah. Yeah. The arrest becomes, it takes place because apparently Carlton Dotson called 911 dis the dispatcher. Okay. Dotson said he had an emergency and requested that the police be told where he was and how to find him. Now, some of what Dotson said to police has not been made public because it pertains to his mental condition, so protected information according to state law. Uh -huh. But what we learn is this. He says he was hearing voices and that he was afraid for his life. Dotson told police that people want to kill him because he is Jesus, the son of God. I yeah. If he's Jesus, the son of God, people want to kill him. Okay. He, he said he was from a family of prophets and that he could see who was going to heaven. Okay. So this is a new skill above his basketball skills. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So this is a strange turn of events, to you, say the least. <laughs> you think? Right. But okay, can I just point out the obvious? Mm-hmm. Waco. This is not the first person from Waco that... Has claimed to be a prophet? Yeah. What is in that water? Right, right. That's that's a good Don't question. drink the water in Waco. On the next episode, we will be sampling water from Waco, Texas. <laughs> no. So this gets a little more involved, especially on Carlton Dotson's part. Okay. So he's essentially, I guess, turning himself in, and I'm sure that it's not quite clear to police what he's turning himself in for other than the fact that he's saying, hey, I'm afraid. People are going to kill me. Yeah. So they get this guy to the police department and they tell him, Hey, you're safe here. You need to tell us everything that's going on with you so we can protect you or, or what have you. And this is when they're realizing our suspicions were correct. This Carl Dotson guy probably was involved with something that happened to Patrick Dennehy or he he's aware of it. Right. To which Carl Dotson never really denies killing Patrick Dennehy. In fact, he goes on to say that that he did kill Patrick Dennehy, but this was in self-defense. This was his argument was going to be a self-defense argument. He says that at some point when they went out to target shoot and to practice shooting these guns, that Patrick Dennehy pointed a gun at Dotson. Mm -hmm. And he even, he even pulled the trigger and Dotson says that the gun either misfired or, or didn't fire at all, whatever happened. Right. To which Carl Dotson responds by shooting Patrick twice. We have this individual in custody. He's not denying murdering Patrick Dennehy, but he's already putting together a self-defense argument for whatever took place. And then on top of that, he's got some questionable things going on inside his head. Right. So he believes that he's Jesus. He also believes that he's, uh, he's from a family of prophets. He also can tell whether or not people can go to heaven or hell. And he is feeling threatened at some point though. He's feeling threatened. It's I'm trying to back it up a little bit because their roommates is it possible that he is hearing this stuff in his head and he starts feeling that he's threatened? 
and and so therefore uh, therefore Dennehy starts filling that or is he just going based off of what his roommate says I mean because if you live with somebody and you and you come home and they go a couple people called us and they're threatening us and you don't know your roommate to be he's not telling you that he's Jesus he's not telling you he's a prophet do you just believe that you see what I'm saying I I Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but we have two individuals that go to coaches and say, hey, we feel threatened. Two individuals that buy guns. Was it just this, it almost seems like a schizophrenia thing happening with Dotson. Is he taking that and, and making Dennehy believe him uh, without, without actual evidence? I think you're really on to something here because some things that we got to factor in here as well. Patrick Dennehy was not at Baylor University for a very long period of time. Yeah. I mean, he transferred there. He sat out a year. These two individuals did not live together for that the entirety of that time. We have, we have Dotson, who was married. He was living elsewhere. It wasn't until his marriage fell apart that he ends up shacking up with Patrick Dennehy and this other guy, Chris Turk. You really have to question how well did Patrick Dennehy, in fact, know Carlton Dotson. Right. They, before this, this, what is now believed to be a murder, they only lived together a handful of months before this all went down. And it gets very confusing here because I think you're, you've really hit the nail on the head where you wonder if the... The perceived threat by Patrick Dennehy, is it just because it's the spillover factor from being roommates with this guy? Right. Because in the early reports, it states something to the effect that, well, we have Patrick Dennehy. We have the other roommate who says, he comes out and says, Patrick Dennehy was concerned about threats that Carlton Dotson was receiving. Right. Is this, and then is this Carlton Dotson later saying, no, 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 I'm, it, they're threatening you too. They're threatening all of us that live here. Right, right. You're in on this now. Somebody broke into our home and stole money. We're not safe here. Hide your children, hide your wife, hide your husband too. And like you said, they did go to police. Whatever was going on at this time, whether it be real or something manufactured by Carlton Dotson or something that Carlton Dotson believed to be real, we know that, that Patrick Dennehy believed this enough that he went with Dotson to the coaches to report this on July 26th. So this is just five days after Carlton Dotson is arrested. Police announced that they have found a badly decomposed body in one of the areas provided to them by Carl Dotson. The medical examiner's office would later identify the body as Patrick Dennehy and early reports state that he died from gunshot wounds to the head. Patrick Dennehy's funeral service is held in his home state of California. About 300 people were in attendance at this beautiful ceremony at Jubilee Christian Church Center, not far from his parents' home. This was a celebration of Patrick's life, much more so than to mourn his death. The space was filled with friends, family, teammates, and of course, his longtime girlfriend. MC Hammer was present and gave a speech and told some stories. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. 
Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. Major phone carriers make you sign contracts with rigid data plans to trap you into a kind of forced phonogamy. Sounds pretty insecure if you ask me. At Consumer Cellular, we believe in a more consensual and healthy form of phonogamy, free of contracts and more flexible to your data needs. This way, you stick around not because we force you to with contracts and fees, but because you love our phone plans. Like ardently love our phone plans. Phonogamously. Consumer Cellular. When Freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM. All right. Cheers, mates. We are back. Cheers to you, Captain. Now, question for you. This Carlton Dot- Dotson, did he also create the Yeezys? But what, I don't know what that is. Because, <laughs> you know, Kanye West thinks he's a prophet and he created the Yeezys as a shoe. Well, there there are a lot of complications with this week's case study uh, and regarding just the case itself. So the murder of young Patrick Dennehy, a basketball player at the University of Baylor, and the murder charges brought forward by the state against another Baylor basketball player or former basketball player, whatever you want to call him. Yeah. This opened up a can of worms. And you know when you go to like somewhere like Costco or GFS and they have those giant canned goods? Yeah. I would say this opened up a giant can Con- of worms for the Baylor <laughs> basketball program. Costco size. Yeah. So it turns out that the Baylor basketball program, well, specifically the head coach, Dave Bliss, had violated several NCAA rules and regulations. Several players were receiving improper benefits, and this was Coach Bliss's doing. One of these players was, in fact, Patrick Dennehy. Now, I'm just going to refer to him as Dave Bliss from now on because, in my opinion, he does not deserve to be called coach or deserve the title of a coach. A coach is someone who should be a leader and should be a teacher. And he was working with young adults. And in fact, this this guy is so disgusting. He's a complete weasel of a man that in order to cover up some of his own misdealings, yeah. he was ready to, he had a plan. And his plan was to blame a lot of this on the murder victim, Patrick Dennehy. And we know this to be true because of a very good man that was in this in this case. And this is assistant coach Rouse. So the assistant coach, one of many, he is in these meetings with, with Dave Bliss. And he's like, wait, my boss a lot of this stuff is not adding up what he's saying to us in these meetings. Right. This dude does not seem to be on the up and up. And this coach, this assistant coach is learning of misdealings that he was unaware of. It wasn't like that from, from the top to the bottom, everybody knew what was going on. And in fact, coach Rouse, what he gets, he gets this great idea. He's like, you know what? This guy, Dave bliss is a terrible person. And I'm not going to go down with this guy. So he starts bringing a tape recorder to these meetings. And Wait, hold on. He comes up with this idea all on his own? Yeah. Okay. And so... Good for him. So during one of these tape-recorded conversations between Dave Bliss and assistant coach Rouse, well, you can clearly hear Dave Bliss stating a couple things that they needed there were some tracks that they needed to cover. And specifically, this was $200, or I'm sorry, $2,000 that was made as a down payment on the Chevy Tahoe that Patrick Dennehy was driving at the time of his murder. 
Mm-hmm. The other thing that they needed to clear up was $7,000 in paid tuition, paid for Patrick Dennehy's tuition. So we got a couple problems here. You can't get a vehicle from your coach. You can't get a vehicle from your basketball program. And remember, Patrick Dennehy was not on scholarship at Baylor. Well, he was. But it appears that some of his or all of his tuition was being taken care of. He was he was under the table scholarship. So what Dave Bliss is saying in this recorded conversation, he said, look, we can blame all of this on Patrick Dennehy because he's dead. He can't say anything. He, he can't have a defense for this. He can't tell them what actually was going on. So let's come up with an idea of how we can cover up this $2,000 for the vehicle and $7,000 for the tuition. So you're going to try to take this dead man and try to make some scandal that he stole money somehow? No. Bliss wants to say that Patrick Denny, he was a drug dealer and that he paid for the vehicle and for his tuition with drug deals. Oh. But we know that not to be true because we know this was manufactured by Dave Bliss. So I mean, one, What a scumbag. Right. You know, like, the, this is... A kid that you're supposed to be mentoring, this is a kid that you're supposed to... And look, I, I understand he had, wasn't there a long time. It wasn't like you had this long relationship with him. But because you're crooked, you know... Well, he the, used these offers to entice Dennehy to go to school there and play for the basketball team. Yeah. And I get it. You know, there's somebody out there listening right now that's going, well, Patrick Dennehy accepted that that misdoing. Yeah. And I get I He was in the wrong for that too. I get that. There's rules and regulations and, and, and Patrick Denna he was he was breaking those rules and regulations. But the to the point where Dave Bliss elevates himself to a whole new level of loser is when he's like, Oh, I did this stuff wrong. This guy's not around to say anything differently because he's been murdered and oh we'll just we'll just make up the story that he's a drug dealer and that's how he got the money. Right, which also then puts some cloud around his death. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like if you go, well, Patrick Dennehy, he was involved in all this other stuff. So, okay, well, uh, you know, we we don't know exactly what Carlton is telling us, if it's true or not. But, uh, but you know, it was drug-related, so no big deal. I mean, this is this coach is. He's not a coach. He's, he's yeah, yeah, yeah. So Sorry. some form of justice will prevail here regarding this stuff with Dave Bliss because on August 8th, 2003, Dave Bliss and the Baylor athletic director, Tom Stanton, both resigned. Dave Bliss was forced to resign amidst allegations that he had violated NCAA rules by making financial payments to four players and that he made improper statements to the media characterizing Patrick Dennehy as a drug dealer. The school placed itself on probation, limited itself to seven scholarships for two years, and imposed a postseason ban for one year. Additionally, the NCAA further punished the team by initiating a non-conference ban for the 2005-2006 season and extending the probationary period during which the school would have limited recruiting privileges. Yeah, but it, these guys resign and they just move on to other dirty games. Yeah, Dave Bliss is coaching elsewhere. I, he's he's taken a significant step back in his in his career, let's say. But unfortunately, and this is not just America. This is most of society. It, we live in in a society where a lot of people or at least some, because there's evidence of such, some people are willing to turn a blind eye to very bad behavior and choose winning over character. And it's just despicable. So we won't, we won't discuss Dave bliss where he is now or what he's up to, but his new name is turd Ferguson. But for those of you that didn't know the, the story behind the story, you now know who Dave Bliss is. What a bag of But our story our story's dicks. far from done here. Okay. So on this is in October. 
Carlton Dotson was declared incompetent to stand trial, this by a district judge, and he was sent to a state mental hospital to be evaluated. And this evaluation, the judge was going to allow for four months of evaluation. Three psychiatrists, including one appointed by the court, said that Dotson appeared to be suffering from hallucinations and psychosis, but that he could regain uh, competency to stand trial in the future. Mm -hmm. Now, in February of 2005, Dotson was returned to jail after psychologists deemed him competent to stand trial, but that he must continue taking his antipsychotic medication. The psychologist also said that Dotson's accounts of hallucinations and hearing voices were, quote, suspect. Prosecutors and Dotson's defense team tried. This is this is just this part of the story is I don't ever remember us reporting this in any other case. OK, prosecutors and Dotson's defense team tried to work out a plea agreement, but could not agree on the terms of that agreement. Hmm. So they're working on a possible plea agreement. They can't agree on the terms. I think that the. The thing that was really in question, what they were battling on, was the length of time that he would have to serve. Anyway, no agreement is reached. But then on June 8th, 2005, just five days before Dotson's trial for murder was to begin, Dotson unexpectedly pled guilty to killing Patrick Dennehy. And to be perfectly clear, this is without a deal. Carlton Dotson was sentenced to 35 years in prison, and he will be eligible for parole in 2021. So yeah. this is a case that I like to file under the solved but unresolved category for many reasons. There's You, you seem to have the answer to what, what went down and, and somewhat how it went down, but then you're left with all these extra questions, you know, like was Carlton Dotson actually competent or incompetent? Was he, did he know what he was doing? And this whole self-defense or versus murder claim that's because this thing never went to trial. Those are the answers that we do not have. And we don't get to, we don't get to have them. We really can only just sit back and examine this thing and form our own opinions and conclusions. Yeah, and it's, this whole thing is weird. I mean, go back to David Bliss with, or AKA Turd Ferguson. The thing is, is we don't know if these claims or these threats were real. So we don't even know if both people went to these coaches. Unless we have assistant coaches coming we, we, forward. Yeah, there were, it sounds to me, according to yeah, but is Patrick's it, mother's statement, that, that multiple coaches said that there was something going on, that there was complaints or that he was being stalked. So it wasn't just Dave Bliss uh, manufacturing this. It sounds to me like multiple coaches were talked to by these basketball players. Yeah, but again, we don't know... But we don't know if those are even real we in the sense right, that... Right, right, right. But, but, for, but what I'm saying is, let's say you have a problem, and I don't know what it is, and I'm I'm not trying to take a giant leap here, but just roll with me for a second. You got a problem, you have some shady stuff going on in your program, and you have this guy that you might think is uh, going to be the 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 chink in the armor, right? Mm -hmm. And that that is Patrick Dennehy, right? And for whatever reason, then you tell his roommate, "Hey, we got these threats coming, and then you got this money missing, blah blah blah." Uh, you know, uh, you're gonna get these guns. Then you're gonna practice shooting them. You're gonna kill him when you're out there. You kill him when you're out there. You'll start saying that you heard voices, blah blah blah. And the reason why I say that all that stuff seems so made up is you have a third person that lived with them that didn't make any of these claims beforehand. You know what I mean? Like he didn't say that his roommate seemed off, that Carlton seemed off, that that Carlton seemed like that he was, you know, hearing voices. 
doesn't say any of that. So just all of a sudden, magically, roommate goes away, and all of a sudden he thinks he's Jesus, thinks he's from a family of prophets, and uh, then then kills his roommate. It's just, it just it doesn't make a lot of sense. No, of course it doesn't. And then on top of that, you got somebody that they're they're saying is competent to fit trial or to stay in trial as long as he's, as he's medicated, but that's even questionable. And then all of a sudden they can't come up with a deal, so there is no deal, so I'll just plead guilty. A lot of this doesn't make any sense. Like we're missing pieces of the story. Right, and that's why I point out that because this thing didn't go to trial, that leaves some of these questions as just unanswered. They're open-ended questions that are unanswered. So a couple of things here. It's difficult in any of these situations when it's tough to form an opinion. And sometimes I don't even think that I should because I'm not the right guy, not the right person for the job. I can't tell you I'm not educated enough or have, or even have sat down face to face with Carlton Dotson to give you an opinion on his mental state. It would be foolish for me to do so. So in that situation, you just go, you know what? I'm going to leave it to the powers that be to people, to more interested parties that are better equipped to handle this type of thing. The problem is they come out with two different answers. In my opinion, he, yes, he's competent in the end after four months, he's competent to stand trial as long as he keeps taking this medication. Yeah. So that doesn't really give you a clear understanding. If, if in fact, he believed if he was hallucinating and believed these threats or if he manufactured them to put Patrick Dennehy in a position of vulnerability. Yeah. Because you, but why, it, what was his motivation? Well, he's a loser. I, and, right. And, but I don't even know if it's that simple and that's what, that's what's creepy to me. I, I don't know if it's that simple. I, maybe it is. No, I'm just saying that there's a whole university involved in this and there's coaches and there's higher beings. Yeah, but I I don't I don't feel like the coaches had anything to do with the the murder of Patrick Dennehy. What I'm getting at, and and I know that I shouldn't just say it so simple as he's a loser. That is just the 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 introduction for my argument. Okay, we have Carlton Dotson, who is is leaving the team. He's not going to be playing on the team anymore. He's just lost his wife. He doesn't have anywhere to live. He doesn't have a job. He doesn't have a team to play for. And who's his buddy? The the kid that in his eyes probably has it all. He's on the team. He's getting improper benefits to be on the team. He's got a girlfriend. He's got everything going for him that Carlton does not have going for him. And could Carlton have manufactured a, a reason to – one, let's get some guns. Two, let's let's put him let's put this guy in a in a place of vulnerability where we are out in the open by ourselves. And maybe Patrick Dennehy's even walking around with a gun that he purchased himself. Because here's the here's the thing. If this whole case didn't fall apart very quickly on Carlton Dotson, you have to wonder if they would have found Patrick Dennehy a year or 18 months or two years later out in this very remote location and he's out there with a, with a gun, do they go, well, maybe he killed himself. Right. Maybe he shot himself in the head. Now where it gets to be difficult. And I think where Carlton Dotson got scared and realized that whole plan that I tried to set into motion is not going to work because I had to do a double tap. I had to shoot the guy twice. And then on top of that, According to the L.A. Times, Patrick James Dennehy II was shot twice in the head and did not have alcohol in his system, and another source states no drugs were found in his system either. The L.A. Times goes on to say both gunshot wounds were above the right ear. The first bullet exited Dennehy's forehead above the left eye. The second exited behind the left ear. According to the autopsy by the Southwestern Institute of Forensic Sciences in Dallas, the report does not say how long Dennehy had been dead, but he was missing for about six weeks when his body was found on July 25th in a field near a rock quarry four miles south of the Baylor campus. 
So I can't, without this thing going to trial and having somebody that's better educated to tell us and explain all of this to us, what I can say here is I don't know that this that the wounds match up perfectly with Dotson's story. Right. Of he was aiming a gun at me and whether he was joking around or whatever and it misfired or it didn't fire or whatever and then I shot him twice. This almost looks like somebody came up behind him, yeah. stuck the gun to the side of his head, or this was some kind of execution style murder. Yeah, or which was which would never fall into place with the the self defense argument that he's posing, and that's where it makes you wonder if he just at the last minute went, "I'm a real shit bag. I don't want this thing to go to trial because then all these other things are going to come out. All the 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 details of the story are going to be filled in, and at least if I go and plead guilty this way." I have a system, I have a setup where it's, I had a defense where I was, I was losing it a bit. I was hallucinating. I didn't really know what was going on. And then on top of that, he pointed a gun at me and I fired. There's even, there's even times when he's been in prison and he's been interviewed and he said to the person interviewing him, well, what would you do? The guy was pointing a gun at me. Right. What would you do? And I I just wonder with the strange way of, they were in talks. They were in talks to try to come to some kind of plea agreement. It was never going to be that Carlton Dotson wasn't going to be guilty of this murder. But what was going to happen if this thing went to trial, again, the details, the blanks, all that could have been filled in. The story could have been completed. And we might have had a better picture if, in fact, Carlton Dotson was, in fact, competent or incompetent or if the self-defense argument has is even an argument at all yeah it's, it's it's very strange i mean on one aspect you want to go okay he drank too much of the waco water he thought he was jesus he hallucinated even if it's not self-defense even if he just hallucinated that well then there's that makes the story somewhat make sense and then you just okay call it a day and the thing that came out was that that they were paying uh, Patrick under the table and probably paying some other players under the table and they got caught. So the coach had to resign and then he moves on with his life. That That's one thing, but because, because the evidence doesn't match up with his story and we don't know because there's multiple reports on, you know, he's competent. He's not competent. You know, was he hearing voices? We don't know. You just wonder if there's something bigger here. Was well, there, was and there, there was the was the threats a setup in order to get the guns, in order to get them to be alone, so then they could. It just seems like we're missing some of the story, and, and we'll probably always will be missing it because I think Carlton's going to sit there in prison and and just rest on this idea. Uh, I was hallucinating. I was hearing things. He threatened me. That's in the story. Well, and there's people out there still to this day that question, could more than one person have been involved in the murder of Patrick Dennehy? And no, it doesn't seem to me that anybody questions that, that Carlton Dotson was involved or that the that Carlton Dotson should be in prison for this murder. Nobody seems to be questioning that. It's everybody feels like we just don't have the whole complete story. And we did mention that little story of a maintenance worker finding a gun in the apartment complex of another teammate. And so these things are just, unfortunately, it has to fall into that solved but unresolved compartment there. Because I don't think, I mean, we're we're two years away from Dotson's, being eligible for parole we're not we're not getting we're not going to get the answers to these questions this is how they are going to remain we want to thank everybody for listening and thanks for telling a friend do we have any recommended reading for this week? Why, yes, we do, Captain. This week we are recommending Under the Bridge 
by Rebecca Godfrey. This is a true story of a horrific murder. It's a must-read book. You'll want to go to our website. We have all of the recommended reading there for you on the recommended page. And while you're there, check out Stitcher Premium. We have another show called Off the Record. You can sign up right now on Stitcher Premium for a free month. And they have like 21,000 hours of premium podcast available on there. So it's not just us. Check out our other show, Off the Record. But what's cool is we have over 60 episodes. So if you're wondering, like, hey, I'm all caught up on True Crime Garage, the main show. What else can I listen to? Check out Off the Record. And until next week, everybody out there, please be good, be kind, and don't litter. You can start your day off right. When you find a professional on Angie to get your plumbing right first. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Visit Angie.com. You can do this when you Angie that.